Welcome to the tower. This is the first talk. This is Embed Embedded Debian by the man who needs only one name, Wookie. Um, if you're watching this at home, um, the ILC channel to submit questions to is hash DC6 hyphen talks hyphen tower on Freenode. If you're watching the wrong stream, you might want hash DC6 the hyphen talks hyphen hack lab to talk to Abba and his Python boff. Um, right, without much further ado, Wookie. Hello. So, yes, um, uh, this is supposed to be a boff rather than a talk, so uh, I'm not quite sure how to play this, but um, uh, as there's lots of people that I don't recognize, I think I should cover some of the ground of where we're at with embedded Debian at the moment and uh, then open it up to talk about whatever people want to discuss. So um, I'll do that by uh, basically talking about the Extra Majira meeting um, because that covers everything we're currently doing. We went uh, at the um, behest of the Spanish government to uh, spend five days uh, having a big session uh, in Extra Majira, which was um, a fine event. Uh, we got quite a lot of people together, all the ones who are actually doing stuff, and uh, made some real progress on uh, all the things we've been meaning to do for years. So uh, the first of those is Scratchbox 2. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Scratchbox. It's a, a cross-compiling environment uh, which, by means of devious techniques, um, lets applications think they're natively building, but uh, actually cross-build them. So you can do things faster and not have to worry about all the things you haven't built yet, uh, which, uh, particularly for Debian with its um, wide range of dependencies, uh, makes it much easier to get started building from scratch. Um, the problem with it is that you actually need a great big 400 meg pile of stuff because of all the documentation tools and, and things that uh, stuff build depends on. And uh, keeping that up to date is a bit of a pain. So Scratchbox 2 uh, is a mechanism to actually use the standard Debian packages uh, but still perform the, uh, the magic uh, sandboxing so that uh, stuff works, and uh, they prove that a scheme using, well, there are two possible schemes to basically intercept calls to um, open and all the file calls via glibc uh, and send them to other binaries. So uh, if you actually wanted to run a, an ARM version of something, uh, it would go off and go, ah, you should want this, this version over here, really. So it would run different files from the actual paths presented and as a mechanism for configuring all that. So so that's possible and uh, hopefully will be available to use um, maybe this year, depending on how fast people work on it. Uh, Nship over there can tell you all the sordid details. Um, we also worked on the cross tools. Uh, at the moment, there aren't uh, a standard set of cross compilers in Debian um, which is a bit of a pain. So anybody who wants to cross-build for ARM needs to build themselves a toolchain. So we've been maintaining some at uh, mdebian.org, but um, it's hard work keeping them up to date because people keep uploading new versions of the compiler every three weeks. And so we have to rebuild all the cross versions so that they still install on testing and unstable. Uh, we've been doing that. Um, but it looks like we've now persuaded the powers that be that we can have uh, a set of common cross compilers uh, in Debian. Obviously, you don't want every conceivable version of um, SH3 to MIPSL cross compiler because they're all nearly all useless. But all the ones that run on fast machines that people actually have, like x86, AMD64, PowerPC, two um, common targets um, uh, will be in main, which will make life a lot easier because you just apt get whatever cross compiler you want. Uh, so we have patches that work. Um, we just have to actually 
put those in. And if anyone's volunteering to do that work this week, that would be marvellous, because then it might actually happen. Um, I've also been working on SH3 cross tools, uh, a guy called uh, Jonas something or other, uh, Meyer, um, has got all enthused about making the SH3 cross build stuff work and has been doing a fine job. Uh, so since last year, I don't know if any of you came to see me uh, witter on about Embedded Debian uh, at the, the previous DebConf. Uh, we had a lot of plans and schemes, but not much in the way of actual working stuff. Uh, and that's changed enormously this year. So uh, we now have two working distributions. Uh, there's Slind and Stage. Uh, so Slind's been done by uh, a couple of guys at Siemens uh, in St. Petersburg. And that uses uh, the dpackage cross mechanism uh, in Debian to to cross build tools properly in the autoconf way. Uh, it uses a, a BSD installer, and um, the only bit that isn't beautiful is there's no real way with the current way that Debian's install scripts work to tell if you've just built a whole load of stuff on your build machine, and you now have the target cheroot, um, it's difficult to run the scripts on that cheroot without them going and affecting your build system, because there's no way of, of telling a post ints that its, its roots moved. Um, so what they did was um, actually copy the post ints over to the target, and, then, and well, NFS mount it on the target, uh, and then run the scripts there, um, which is neat. Um, but the problem is that if your target doesn't have Ethernet, uh, this mechanism is no use to you for getting things actually configured. Uh, Scratchbox is actually another way of solving this problem. Um, you can, it can pretend that the route has moved for your purposes and uh, thereby deal with the problem of, of running install scripts, uh, which was something I hadn't realized until recently. So that's a, that's a really cool feature. So Slind is good. There's about 40-odd packages um, done. Uh, you can build things with it. It supports uh, ARM, MIPS, uh, I can't what else. PowerPC, I think. Um, a, a set of common targets, basically. Um, we also have Stage, which uses the um, is an extension of the STAG scheme, which I detailed last year. Um, using an MDebian directory instead of a Debian directory uh, with changed rules and postscript and scripts and dependencies. Uh, but it uses Scratchbox to do the actual cross-compiling. So you know, the whole cross-compiling thing is just solved and you make it Scratchbox's problem. Uh, and again, there's 40-odd uh, packages uh, done. And uh, one useful thing that happened at the Extra Majura conference was that we realized um, that one of, the, one of the advantages of the stage mechanism with a separate directory is uh, that you can, you can have an arbitrary number of these directories. So it's easy to do. So you normally have a Debian directory with the rules and, and build information in it. Um, then you have an mDebian directory with uh, the embedded version. But you can also have a uh, my favorite widget directory um, and all you do is change this one variable, Debian dir, uh, and that will override the normal rules with your rules. So it makes it very easy to personalize the distribution for your particular purpose, which um, people usually find they want to do for any given embedded project. Um, so what that means, in fact, is that you can just put the slind rules in a directory called slind, uh, and slind becomes a subset of uh, merely one particular flavor of, of this mechanism. So uh, they realize that, in fact, they are the same project, really. Um, and we're in the process of merging the two sets of patch patches um, at mdebian.org. And then basically, you'll have a choice of whether to build it dpackage cross style or scratch box style. Uh, in principle, either can work. So um, that's all jolly good stuff. Uh, you, can, you can download those and try them now. Um, I'm intending to try and do a build for uh, a board I've brought with me this week. And if anyone else wants to have a play, uh, please come along. Is Ed here? No. So the man who's done all the uh, 
uh, stage work is actually at this conference, but um, yeah, he obviously hasn't got up this morning. We also talked about the ARM EABI transition, which isn't, strictly speaking, part of Embedded Debian, but um, most many of the people involved have an interest in that as well. Um, we've got a separate boff on that, so I shan't cover it uh, at any length now, but basically ARM is changing its ABI uh, generally, not particularly because of Debian, but just um, well, because of ARM Limited, really, and the rest of the world. Uh, so we're going to have to follow suit at some point, and we've been working out how to do that, which basically is going to be a new ARM architecture, which is different from the old ARM architecture, because uh, trying to move from one to the other is uh, difficult. Other people worked on Debian installer for various widgets and QEMU, which is the emulator that will um, is one way of of running non-native binaries on your build machine. So uh, I explained about Slind and Stage, their basic um, differences uh, and commonalities. So that's where we're at. Uh, quite a lot of progress since last year, a lot of stuff happening. There still isn't like an MDebian um, uh, distribution you can just download for a whole range of targets, but we're getting quite close to that. Um, more people. Uh, coming along and doing work will obviously speed things up. So anyone who's really enthused is most welcome. Uh, so the question really that I was going to talk about today was um, now now what? Um, the things that became clear from the Extra Majira meeting were that the next thing, simplest the next thing to do is get cross tools in Debian main. Um, I'd like to try and do that this week. Uh, with a bit of luck, uh, anyone who's enthused about that sort of thing, please come along and kick my ass, uh, or otherwise help. <laughs> um, the stage and slind both will benefit from more packages. Obviously, 40 packages is a minimal base system. Uh, you know, you get X and some networking and a shell uh, and a few utilities, but um, nothing terribly exciting. So. Uh, packaging more packages uh, for for stage it's generally pretty much a, a case of replacing every instance of slash debian with dollar debian dir um, that gets you a functioning package and then you can worry about the details and uh, just remove a few bits for installing documentation um, we'd like to do some slightly smarter uh, ways of dealing with the metadata. So um, one of the fundamental things that people want to do with embedded systems is throw away all the docs. You know, it's not complicated. <laughs> um, we just don't want them. They're too big uh, and they take ages to build uh, and bring in a whole load of dependencies you didn't want. So, um, and we are working on policy for package maintainers so that um, you know, there's a whole load of stuff you can do as a package maintainer which makes it much easier for the embedded people to build parts of your package or whatever. Um, but of course, people don't know what they should be doing. So we're, we've started some documentation on um, uh, a few more deb build uh, options like no docs and no test, which will basically not bother building any docs and not bother running any tests. Um, that would be a huge step forward just if we had that in, in most packages. There's also a whole load of stuff uh, about um, build dependencies. So at the moment, because Debian's always been designed for native builds, there's no concept of um, dependencies which are actually required on the target as opposed to the build machine. So quite a lot of things build, um, you know, most of the dependencies are actually on the build machine, um, but sometimes there's a few things which get run natively during the build. Um, and if we were to improve the, uh, to segment the dependency lists a bit so that it actually said whether these were things which were supposed to be native packages or supposed to be um, build architecture packages, uh, that would make the, our lives a lot easier. Um, but we need to get uh, changes made in the, in the policy to, to get people to start doing that. Uh, at the same principle applies to dependencies 
which are either runtime or install time. So again, there's a whole load of stuff which is actually only used by the uh, install scripts, for example, update menus. So you don't need that on your target. You only need it at install time, and then you can throw it away again. But obviously, to have a generalized system to do that, we need, uh, we need to know whether this is a dependency that's needed at runtime or only at install time. So again, um, a bit more uh, segmentation there would improve our lives a great deal. Um, Multi-arch is uh, also related to what we're doing. A number of things uh, in terms of cross-building are made easier by, uh, well, and, and installing are made easier by um, the multi-arch proposal. So we're, we're very keen to see that happen. Um, I gather there's a small team trying to push it forward uh, and we'll do our best to, to help out. Is there any multi-arch people here? No, I know Matt Taggart is at this conference, but he's not here this morning. Um, so those are the those are the things that need doing now. Um, there are a few issues still under debate. The biggest one probably is um, is where to put our metadata. So the thing you need to do to build embedded packages is have extra metadata that says things like these are docs so you don't need them uh, or um, we don't want to do this and we don't want to do that. Um, and there's two kind of fundamentally different ways of doing this. So there's the way it's done for Debian installer using uh, the UDEB mechanisms and extra information and there's um, the stage mechanism of having another directory uh, which changes the rules uh, not in normally in the in the Debian DIR, or you could change them in the Debian DIR. Um, and the, the 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 philosophical difference is: Do you want to produce a set of packages with the same names as normal Debian packages, but different contents, um, smaller, maybe a few obscure things missing because you really don't need them, uh, or do you want to produce a set of different packages with different names. Um, and these let you do different things. So um, if what you wanted was something that looks like Debian but is in fact a bit shrunk and won't necessarily do the name thing, main, the same things, um, then the stage mechanism is the way to achieve that. The problem with that is that um, it's not compatible with uh, standard Debian packages. So if we if we miss out a load of bits and bobs from various things because most of the time you don't need them, the problem is there'll be some package somewhere which you might then install from normal Debian which did actually need one of those things we threw away. Um, and because we've got the same name, so we're claiming to be that package, the dependencies will work, but it'll just barf. Um, now, that doesn't matter unless you're mi trying to mix packages from um, Debian main and from, from the mDebian repository. Um, so that's, that's the problem with that scheme. But it's, not, it's conceptually simple. Everybody can understand how it works. Maintainers can understand how it works. It's great. Um, so the UDEB system um, you, is, is rather more rigorous, really, in that you get, if a package is different, it's got a different name. Um, and so you have to have different dependencies if you're going to depend on those. So you get a whole separate um, section of of stuff, and you, you can and you can have the two, um, you can have the, the standard Debian packages and the UDEB versions in the same namespace. Um, so if that's what you want to do, which of course is what Debian installer wants to do, um, that's the way to do that. So at the moment, nobody's really working on building embedded Debian the UDEB way, uh, apart from the DI team, uh, with their sort of specialized version of embedded Debian, effectively. Um, so there was quite a lot of argument as Extra Majura about which of these th things we should be doing. Um, some people like one, some people like the other. Um, so that's still an open issue. There's no, we haven't decided particularly, but r right at the moment people are working on the Debian uh, scheme, so um, that's what'll get done. Uh, if anyone uh, believes this is a terrible idea, I mean the problem with this is that once you start doing something, it tends to collect momentum and that'll be what we do forevermore. Um, <laughs> So 
that's an issue, and uh, I'd be very happy to talk to anyone about it. Um, we can discuss it some more today if anyone is interested. Uh, the other thing is getting what we're doing back into Debian Main, because the main problem with, um, you know, the, both both Slind and Stage are currently just forks of a snapshot of Debian, which is fine, but you can't maintain that for long. Once you've got a few hundred packages, you're now maintaining the whole of Debian again yourself, um, which at the moment, with about three people doing it part-time, is hopeless. So we have to get that stuff back into main so that package maintainers look after it by and large. I mean, they, there isn't a great deal to do, but if they change their rules, which people do occasionally, it would be nice if they changed the MDB and rules to correspond if there's any changes needed. Um, so we've got some some mind share, I think, still to get, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm here bullshitting, um, to persuade people that you know, embedded stuff matters, and Debian ought to work on small devices, the same as it works on laptops and servers, and uh, a little bit of, of effort all round is needed to, keep, to make that work. Um, we need lots more docs. Uh, we're starting to improve that, and now that there's actually stuff to describe which normal maintainers can uh, understand, um, we, we've started writing down things people need to do and things we'd like to see. Wow. Um, right. Uh, that's all I've basically got to say. Um, uh, I hope that made sense. If Obviously, if you have taken no interest whatsoever in the embedded sphere before, most of that was probably complete gobbledygook, and I apologize. Um, uh, as I say, I was, I was planning for a boff rather than a talk to loads of people who knew nothing about the subject. I suggest people ask questions. Uh, feel free to ask very stupid questions, because I probably missed out most of the basics at the beginning. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Um, so he was asking whether, uh, as a normal maintainer, he needs to, uh, he's going to have a mechanism for testing his rules uh, within MDebian. Um, and I think the answer is it's not something we've thought about at all. Um, yes. What you would need to do is. Uh, install the so the way stage works in order to this this with this change Debian de variable basically a, a remarkably small number of tools actually care you need to teach dpackage about it deb helper um, dpackage cross and well, about two other things cdbs so um, basically you would just install the mdebian tools which in fact should be in main well, yeah the 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 different, all the difference, all the changes we make are totally invisible unless you change the Debian de variable. So everything will proceed exactly as it did before. Um, if it's just, um, if it isn't set, it defaults to slash Debian. Everything works as before. So you'd install the new versions of the tools, um, which in fact, hopefully, you would just have because they'll become the standard versions of the tools. Uh, and you just set dollar Debian de equals m Debian and build your package. And if it comes out okay, then yes, it works. So, um, Enchip wanted to say something? Yeah, I would just like to advertise that we actually wrote a document that tells what are the best practices for developers to make their packages cross-compilable and you easy, easily usable in embedded, basically including stuff like don't use GIMP to make your logos in the Debian rules. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's there's a number of issues beyond just testing to do with, uh, yes, doing strange things at compile time, like like auto-generating your logo by running up a version of GIMP. And you know, if you just put the file in, uh, then uh, that enormously reduces the complexity of cross-compiling. 
And so people produce all sorts of Baroque systems um, for doing strange things at compile time, which need to run on the the target. Um, so you know, because they never think about the fact that the target might be different from the build machine. You know, it's not something most people are thinking about. Um, so people need to think about that. And obviously, it's up to us to to explain what the problems are um, to people who haven't really looked at this issue before. So we've started doing that, uh, and we'll. Uh, once we're, we need to fill that out with a lot of examples so that people actually understand the point. Uh, and uh, basically, if you have a look at that and go, am I doing any of this bad stuff? Um, that should be all you need to do. And it, yeah, it's a one-off thing. You just have a look at your build system and take out anything that's unhelpful. And you, know, you never need to change it again. Any more for any more? Hi, thank you. I'm Mark Allen. I'm a very much newbie in the whole area of um, embedded processing, and um, this is primarily for a personal project of mine. And I see an awful lot of hardware being offered, like board, small one-board computers, stackable module computers, and stuff like that. But I am such a newbie. I don't know what I'd want, and I don't like. I don't know the very basics. Where can I go just to get the very basics, like embedded processing for dummies, and um, like basic? How do you load? Once you comp cross compile, how do you load it into the machine? Do you use something like JTAG or just what? And how do I find this very basic information? Thank you. Um. Yes, it's a good question. There's the problem with the answer to that question is that it depends enormously on the hardware you actually choose. So, for example, how you load in the image you've created depends almost entirely on the bootloader um, on the hardware you've got. So, uh, you know, it might be supplied with a bootloader you've heard of, like U-Boot or Red Boot, uh, in which case you use the Red Boot and U-Boot commands. Uh, you know, they're quite if it's got Ethernet. So usually the the very initial stage is indeed JTAG. That, you know, once you, when you've got a bare thing straight out of the factory, it doesn't do anything. You've usually got to use JTAG to fill up any um, CPLD or FPGA logic on the board and get an initial bootloader in. Um, but usually the manufacturer will have done that. So you as a user hardly ever have to do that unless you're messing about with the bootloader and royally screw things up and turn it into a brick. Um, and there are open JTAG tools, uh, which are increasingly functionful. And JTAG has, in fact, expanded beyond its original purpose. So you can also use it for a lot of testing. Uh, there's lots of, lots of stuff you can do to see whether your hardware is actually wired up the way it's supposed to be wired up. And you can use JTAG for that. Um, but normally, you're only ever dealing with a bootloader to get images loaded in. And each bootloader has its own commands and functionality. And obviously, it depends on the board whether it's got, if it's just serial or USB or um, Ethernet. They're the usual ways of uploading things. So that part is always terribly specific. Um, it's almost impossible to generalize. Um, but whoever provides your board will need to tell you how to get stuff on it. Whoever provides the board, you know, whoever you buy the hardware from, will generally tell you how to get stuff onto it. Unless, of course, it's hardware that they weren't intending you to get Linux on, in which case you have to work it out. So I should ask them, yeah. do they That's right. Your, li your life will be much easier if they do. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and, and for an awful lot of sort of portable devices like PDAs and things, you know, things that come with Pocket PC on them, um, the vendors won't tell you anything useful about how it works. So in fact, there's very unlikely to be a kernel that works on it because um, you know, if they don't, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to write uh, working kernels for hardware that people won't tell you how it works. Hardware is, is generally too complicated to reverse engineer in a sensible period of time these days. Okay. So um, that's right. Mm -hmm. And if you particularly want to put embedded Debian on, you could ask them whether they have an embedded Debian port for, the, for their hardware. Now, at the moment, the answer will be no from absolutely everybody, with the possible exception of me. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but um, that is coming. I, I have a comment. Uh, uh, in Japanese embe embedded industry, 
Semiconductor doesn't officially support Linux or Debian, but there are many engineers at Semiconductor Company who has enthusiasm and want to support Debian or Linux for their chips. So, so if you go to officially to Semiconductor Company, you, you perhaps got, will get the answer we don't support Linux, uh, say, uh, in Hitachi or Renesas Technology in Japan, the famous semiconductor company. But, uh, but uh, the fact is there are many engineers who, who support Linux. Right. So yeah. you're saying if you ask the company officially, they'll tell you, no, we don't. But, in fact, there'll be a mailing list somewhere where you can find an engineer who will help. Yeah. So that, that is often the case. It, it's a bottom-up thing. You know, engineers discover that Linux is better, um, usually before management do. So uh, it is often the case that you can find a helpful person, but that's not the answer you'll get from, from marketing or sales. Um, yeah, I mean, there are companies... Well, I mean, at the moment, uh, there's a lot to be said. There's a small number of companies who are very focused on, for example, Debian, uh, and provide hardware, and uh, you know you should support them and buy their stuff basically because um, they are keen to help people like you. So, for example, there's a board called the Loft from Giant Shoulder Inc. Um, Giant Shoulder Inc., um, which is a bloke in the states, <laughs> um, but he makes some nice ARM-based IXP hardware, which makes quite a nice dev board, um, and you know you can already put Debian on that. Um, and balloon board is something I've been involved with, uh, and I'm in the process of putting embedded Debian on that. Um, and there's, there's other things. I mean, Nokia 770s um, are well supported by the tools because most of the people doing the work have been using those as dev boards because they work for Nokia, <laughs> um, and so on. But basically, I mean, if you come to the the mailing list of the channel and say recommend me some hardware, I need it to do this, that, and the other. Um, that's a good way. You know, People like us have a, f a reasonable overview of what's available. Well, it's increasingly difficult, actually, because there's thousands of things available. But we can certainly tell you the people who are involved. Yes, hi. I have a couple of support questions. Like, what are the stage of support for UCLFC based Debian system? Right, yes. Uh, one of the things I forgot to say is that one of the very cool things that Slind does is supports glibc and ulibc uh -huh. builds. So they have cross tools for UCLFC as well as glibc um, via new architectures um, and all the packaging um, assumes you're doing either. But how do you manage, like, Several packages need UCLFC patches, specific patches, to be compiled against it. That's right. So that's like another delegation to maintainers. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, um, yeah, so those, pack th those patches are in Slind at the moment, and the uh -huh. idea is that we'll push those up into uh, Package normal maintain. packages so that they'll support either. Uh -huh. um, now, I don't know how contentious that is. I'm not quite sure if Debian's ready yet to support an alternative C library. Um, and, you know, at the moment, that's not something we do, um, but it's very much something that embedded people would like to see happen. And those patches are fundamentally utterly unintrusive. You know, if you don't use it, you won't notice it. It doesn't do any harm. Yeah. So um, I don't think it's going to be too difficult to persuade people to say, you know, please add this. It makes some people's lives easier, and it's not going to do any harm. Um, yeah. So yes, that is okay. For that's for. LibC library, how about the standard C++ library, UC libc++? The same principles apply, but I don't think anyone's done the work yet. Okay. And uh, how about BusyBox-based uh, system installation, like the base system based on BusyBox instead of core mm -hmm. utils and whatever? Yeah, so that's, that's done. Um, does Slind use BusyBox? Yeah. So. Yeah, I th think, again, Slind can be uh, set up so the base system is basically just BusyBox, um, and you don't bother installing um, a whole load of other packages which it replaces. So, yes, we have that choice. But that will, like, make uh, some problems with dependency of 
the rest of the packages. Uh, that's right. Um, so what we're trying to do is define a, a kind of new essential, because um, the existing essential is basically OK uh, and is provided by BusyBox, almost all of it, apart from Perl, which is currently deemed to be essential, and that's really annoying because it's huge. Yeah. Um, um, and it shouldn't be. <laughs> so um, a slightly longer term goal is to is to get the essential definition moved down a bit to what really is essential, okay. um, and uh, which basically means kicking Perl out. Um, and then you know, so if you don't need it, you don't install it. And then then basically we can say essential is provided by BusyBox or um, the stuff that currently provides it. Um, how will you like manage they need their scripts and stuff like that that like tend to be delicate on sorry possible. how do you plan to manage like you need their scripts to initialize stuff and stuff like that on um, Busybox basis th there's systems? there's a few things i mean um a, f a couple of years ago someone went through all the init scripts and made them uh, ash compatible oh. rather than using any special bashisms mm -hmm. so uh, you know, it doesn't really do any, anyone any harm. It, it, there's very few things that you actually need to use which aren't in the BusyBox versions of things but are in the full versions of things. So um, really, it needs somebody to just go through everything, um, taking out anything that isn't going to work if you replace Bash with um, BusyBox. Well, sorry, if you replace or Mount and so on mm -hmm. uh, with the basic versions. Um, Mount's probably a difficult example, actually. That's one case where you sometimes do need the fancy features. Um, but yeah, it's basically a matter of going through and finding anything that doesn't work and fixing it. That's usually utterly painless, but it does need doing. Okay, perfect. Also, with respect to your like, uh, you were talking about uh, having different packages providing uh, not the complete set of the full package for embedded systems. Uh, have you analyzed the possibility to have like uh, install time mask of which um, part of the hierarchical file system will you populate? Like, do not install everything in your share slash share slash doc. So, yeah. you don't so you're, you're saying just at install time, so you take yeah. a standard package, but you just don't put some of the things in. Exactly. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the dpackage maintainer has been looking at um, a mechanism for having manifests so that you can basically have some rules which it will follow at install time. For, as you say, just you know, don't put anything in user doc. Um, just miss all those out, which, as you say, gets you quite a lot of what you wanted. So the disadvantage of that system is that you still have to build all that stuff, but you never yeah. install it, which wastes a really impressive amount of time. Um, it's quite scary how much of the time you spend building docs with strange doc tools. Um, but clearly, it's it's a useful um, thing to feature to have. It's kind of it's orthogonal, I think, to most of the other stuff. Uh, you know, you can do it. You could do it now today, yeah. um, and it will be really useful. Yeah, but so, you actually already have the full scale packages built. Exactly. So you don't have to rebuild everything. Precisely. So yes, um, it's been looked at. I, I think um, uh, Guillaume would welcome some help in terms of actually implementing that. It's a little bit tricky because you, you know, dpackage is something you don't want to break. <laughs> uh, um, so you have got to be careful making changes to that kind of thing. But uh, I believe he has a plan. I'm not sure it's, it's written down in, in much detail anywhere. Thank you. Kitu just wanted to say something. If you're quick. Well, just, just a quick. Uh, just one thing about multi arch. Uh, I, it seems to me, I, I read somewhere I read in the mail list that I didn't, that there's no idea, no plan to actually have a multi arched. Uh, but user bin or, or bin directory, which seems a bit strange to me because I think multi arch would be useful if you use it in conjunction with QEMU to actually uh, allow people who do not have the pros certain processor architectures to be able to run or, or t test and run their programs on their, on their own PC. Um, yes, I agree. We should talk to the multi arch people. Um, I think I'd, 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 we need to find some. If there's nobody here today. Um, okay, uh, I think. Um, do we have to stop? There's more questions. Um, I'm sorry we have to stop, so um, you can come and ask me afterwards. Um, thank you kindly. <laughs>